on today's Story Beat. The creative process needs comfort. You know, it's, it's really helpful to be in an environment where you feel free and you don't have a chip on your shoulder. And so you don't want to be the guy that agitates that. You want to be the guy that everybody says, yeah, man, he's really cool. He's, you know, he's funny. He's easy, easy, easy to work with. That's a key word. When you're getting recommended, if somebody says you're really easy to work with, that's such a plus. I mean, that, that can sometimes work better than talent. I mean, obviously you have to have <laughs> There's a baseline where, you know, you have to be at least a certain amount of good. But if this guy's a, a little better than you, but you're the guy that's really easy to get along with, you're going to get the gig. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuton, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, Jimmy Ryan, is an American artist, composer, producer, and author with a career that has spanned six decades. Beginning at 17, he and his college band, The Critters, had their first top 40 hit, Younger Girl, which was followed by three charting albums and two more top 40 hits, Mr. Dyingly Sad and Don't Let the Rain Fall Down on Me. In 1970, Jimmy's friend Carly Simon called him to put a band together for her. She was rising fast on the U.S. and British Top 40 charts with That's the Way I've Always Heard It Should Be, as well as her first album, Carly Simon, on which Jimmy played guitar. Jimmy went on to perform with Carly on most of her future albums and continues to work off and on with her to this day. He's the guitar soloist on many of Carly's hits, the most memorable being You're So Vain and the Academy Award-winning Song of the Year, Let the River Run, from the movie Working Girl. Aside from Carly Simon, Jimmy's also recorded with numerous superstars, including no less than Paul McCartney, Mick Jagger, Luther Vandross, James Taylor, Cat Stevens, Jim Croce, John Entwistle, Elton John and Kiki D, The Doors, Rod Stewart, and many more, earning him six gold records and one platinum record. As a studio musician, Jimmy has recorded alongside legendary <laughs> session players like Jim Gordon, Klaus Vorman, Jim Keltner, Nicky Hopkins, Will Lee, Steve Gadd, Lowell George, Robbie Robertson, Paul Schaefer, David Sanborn, and many more. Along the way, he found time to perform in the original Broadway production of Hair, and he was a principal actor and musician in the Broadway production of Pump Boys and Dinettes. Jimmy has scored music for TV, creating themes and music for NBC News, CNBC, MSNBC, Lifetime, USA, and PBS, and he's also composed and arranged and produced music for over 500 radio and TV commercials for clients like Doritos, McDonald's, IBM, Ford, Nikon, Pizza Hut, Budweiser, Chevrolet, Coke, Diet Coke, and more. In April 2019, he and his <clears throat> touring band, The Hitmen, were honored with the first ever Road Warrior Award from the Nashville Musicians Hall of Fame. In 2022, Jimmy published his memoir, Behind, Autobiography of a Musical Shapeshifter. I've read Behind and can tell you it's a fascinating look at the life of a musician working at the highest levels of the music industry. If you want to know what life as a working rock musician is like, I highly recommend you read Behind. And please be sure to stick around at the end of the show today for a real treat. Jimmy has generously loaned us an unreleased song that he wrote and produced called Slow Burn. So for all those reasons and many more, I'm truly thrilled to have the multi-talented Jimmy Ryan join me today. Jimmy, welcome to Story Beat. Thank you. My pleasure being here. It's a great pleasure for me to have you. So <laughs> let's go back in time a little bit. You've been performing for quite some time now. I'm wondering mm -hmm. at what point in your life did all of this musical energy and desire start? How old were you? Well, the energy started probably at late nine years old, early 10 years old. Uh, that was when Dick Clark's American Bandstand was coming into fashion, Ed Sullivan, uh, people like that. And I, I can remember seeing Elvis Presley's first performance on Ed Sullivan. And I just said to myself, I got to do that. And I was never, a, I, of course, I was a fan, but I wasn't 
a fan in the typical sense. I was a fan that I have to do this, not I have to watch this. Very, right. very different. I love these people just like the rest of the fans. But between uh, Elvis, Buddy Holly, Chuck Berry, um, Jerry Lee Lewis, all these these incredible uh, little Richard was one of my big favorites. My dad didn't like him so much, but <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, he 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 preferred Lawrence Welk. It was. <laughs> <laughs> very, di very, di very different kind of uh, taste in music. A little um, different is to say the least. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I thought, well, you know, guitar seems like a good way to go. So I begged and pleaded with my parents and they took me down to a guitar store and uh, I got a rental acoustic guitar and started taking lessons. And, you know, one thing led to another and eventually, well, it was always serious. It was never it was never just playing around. It was always, right. I'm working towards a goal here. Um, you know, and then eventually it became an electric guitar. And then eventually I started playing live probably at around 11, maybe early 12 years old. Um, live not, as a not, solo solo act or, or with others? Well, you, you know, just briefly, uh, my mom wanted to cash in because she'd been spending so much money. So she would just volunteer me. You know, she would go to, we had these things called Fort Light, Fortnightly. I went to a Catholic school and, you know, Fortnightly, Fortnight is two weeks and they had Fortnightly every month or two. So <laughs> go figure, <laughs> you know, the logic escapes me there. But this was for the young boys to meet the young girls and dance to records. It wasn't for a performance. But she said to the nuns, no, my son is so good, you know, and, <laughs> and I was terrified. I had to get in there and I had to play my guitar. I didn't sing at the time. So I would just play some instrumental stuff. And and believe it or not, it went really well. But but the, the crowning one was in junior high when we moved to Port Washington, Long Island. My mom went to the principal's office. She dragged me down there and she said, my son has this fantastic band and he wants to play for the Beehive. Beehive is another one of those dances. It's a mix of kind right, of thing. Right, right. And I just sat there and said, shut your effing mouth. <laughs> what are you doing? I don't have a band. So I had, <laughs> I don't know, two or three weeks to find musicians that could play at all and put a band together and play. So I did, and, and none of them were really good. I had to carry the whole thing, but it kind of worked. The kids liked it. Kids liked it because we were junior high. We were like ninth grade. What do we know about you know live performances? Was there a point in there where you actually thought to yourself, you know what, I am really good at this, and maybe this is something I could do for my life's career? Oh, that thought never left my mind. That was always in my mind. But, you know, I came from a family of engineers, you know, from, from my dad, all his brothers. One of them was a doctor. My mom had a master's degree in a highly educated uh, family. So going off to be a musician wasn't regarded as anything more than a hobby. Uh, so I ended up going to school to study electrical engineering. But there, there was this key moment where uh, we were called into the, uh, the auditorium and the dean of engineering gave us this uh, talk. And he was saying... This is the 60s. And he's saying there is no career more rewarding than than engineering these days. But with you know, the space race and the fantastic cars and radio and TV, nothing I can think of that's that's a better career. <laughs> I don't know, except maybe being a successful entertainer. And I said, that's it. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you actually went to school at Villanova for engineering, right? I did. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious. This is a question I love to ask artists who have had alternative backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Has engineering had any kind of an impact on your musicianship or on your composing or in any part of your career? Has engineering factored into your life as a musician? Hundred percent. Again, you know, my dad. The my dad was an MIT engineer. Uh, my brother also, and my brother got me interested in radio and and building electronic stuff. So he taught me to solder when I was nine years old. I was soldering and creating these things called Heath kits. Do you, I don't know what I remember, remember Heath kits. Sure. Okay, so you, you know, you order them and it comes with boxes of resistors and potentiometers, and, and you assemble this whole thing. So I would start building Heath kits. Lo and behold, things evolved in the music industry, where recording became so inexpensive and easy to do. You didn't really need big studios anymore. You damn well better build your own studio, or you're not going to get the call. So I set to work building my own studio with my soldering skills and my my electronic skills, and I maintained it myself because I understood electronics pretty well. 
Um, so yeah, it was it was a huge benefit. I mean, all those jingles that I did were a result of having a studio before anybody in New York had one. Having a uh, I would call it a demo studio, where people producers could come in and do demos for their jingles, and really cheap because it was in my apartment for crying out loud. I didn't have to charge thousand dollars an hour. I charged like twenty five dollars an hour. How and, did you uh, isolate sound in your apartment? Big moving blankets, you know, those big thick things, quilted right? blankets. I'd hang them on the walls and and uh I'd make people sing in my closet, my bedroom closet. <laughs> oh, things. I'm serious. Uh, but nobody did, cared. Did Everybody your knows. neighbors ever wonder what was going on in your apartment? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> they, they did and eventually I got evicted. So what happened was, in order to give them that cheaper price, I said, look, all you have to do is put me on the musicians or the singers contract. And they said, sure, no problem. So I started getting on all these AFFM, uh, the musicians union contracts. And then eventually I started pushing a little harder. I, I said, you know, I do write. I'm not just an engineer. And so I would compete on the writing. And I said, but if my piece doesn't win, I still get to sing on it. Now, the old rule of thumb is, oh, I can't remember what the formula is, but singers make a load more money than the musicians. I mean, just ridiculously amount more. You know, they're the ones who are buying the houses out in the Hamptons and, sure. you know, that stuff. And the musicians are, you know, hoping to get one in Brooklyn, a small, <laughs> small apartment in Brooklyn. <laughs> but anyway, so I started getting on singers contracts and on musician contracts. And I started winning some of the competitions. And then I started winning a lot of the competitions. So then I started doing a lot of jingles. This this was not the high point in my career. It was the high financial point in my career, but it wasn't fulfilling. I I really didn't like it. I I had to advertise things that I would never buy, you know, and I had to convince other people to buy things that I would never buy. And there was there was in often integrity issues. I drew the line at cigarettes. I wouldn't I wouldn't do cigarette commercials because right. I I had been a smoker and I quit and, you know, I knew uh, my mother-in-law died of, of lung cancer. Mm. So, so I, I can't, you know, can't do that. So, all right. So you mm. were playing guitar from a young age. Oh yeah. And mm -hmm. you got good enough at it where you thought this is a career move. You can become a guitarist and, and a musician for the rest of your life. Well, not exactly in that order. It, what happened was I decided I was going to be a career musician. So I practiced hard enough so that I could be. There you go. That's a great <laughs> philosophy. That's a great that was way to That was the order of events. What have you learned over time about playing the guitar that you wish you had known in the beginning? How to practice. How this to was practice. One, I always just listen to records. I, I have a good ear for, for music and I can hear the elements within music. That's that's part of what this this little show I'm doing. And we can talk about that later is I can break a song down just by ear. I can tell you what every instrument is playing and play it back for you. It's just something, you know, it's genetically built into my DNA. I, That's a real talent, <laughs> isn't it? I guess, you know, I, I don't think of it as anything to brag about. It's just something that's there. So... That's a blessing and a curse because I would just listen. I would start playing. And if I didn't get it, I'd play it. But I would always play it at the tempo that it was coming. You have to practice slowly. And I'm doing it now. And it's just so good. When you have a passage that you can't play, don't try to play it at tempo. Slow it way down. If it's like, da 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 play it, da 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 And when you can play it five times at that speed, take the tempo up a little farther and then play it like that. But re really, really discipline yourself to not be Steve Vai in the first hour. You know, if if, if it's a difficult passage, just slow it down. And, and I remember telling my son this. My son's a fantastic keyboard player. Uh, and he would always sit down and try to play songs as fast as he could, and they'd always be sloppy. And I would say, Ian, slow it down. He hated that. Oh, he just hated it to death. He, <laughs> he wanted to kill me. I said, come on. And I'd sit next to him. I said, slow it down. He'd play it a few times really slow. And I said, okay, now play it in tip. And bam, clean as a whistle. So that's what I would say. Slow even, it down. Even Steve Vai wasn't Steve Vai in the beginning. No. Oh, my God. He was a fanatical practicer. And yeah, I've, sure. I've seen videos of him where he talks about exactly that. He said, I was trying to do this thing, this tapping thing, where you have to go, dun, 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 and you're using both hands tapping, not just one. And it was atonal, and he would play it very, very slowly like that. He said, it took me about two weeks to perfect it. He says, now I've gotten it up to a reasonable speed, and he goes, and he does it so fast, you almost can't hear the notes. 
But he showed how he was learning. It was like one, two, three, oops. And if you make a mistake, you have to stop and go back. Because if you make a mistake and keep going, you print the mistake. That mm -hmm. goes into your memory. Mm -hmm. So you have to, you that's the rule. You stop, correct the mistake from the beginning. And you have to do it five times perfectly before you can bring the tempo up. Doesn't yeah, it's muscle memory. Muscle exactly. memory. Mm -hmm. uh, sure. That's just seems uh, totally logical to me. And I think a lot of people do exactly what you're saying your son and others want to do is to play it immediately as fast as you can. Sure. Sure. And, and I can almost guarantee you that the great players don't do it that way because the great teachers tell them not to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So when I listen to you play and I've listened to a whole bunch of your work, mm -hmm. uh, it's obvious in the playing that you love what you're doing because it comes oh, through. Yeah. Yeah, And yeah. so how much does passion factor into the music as you're playing it? It depends. There, there are, I, I'm not going to name the bands, but there, there are bands I hear that are technically fantastic, but I can't listen to them. You know, I listen, I hear a thousand notes a second and it doesn't mean anything to me. Does it just feel like stuff to you? Yeah. It just feels like, it just feels like intellectual nonsense. I can, I can make a computer do that. Passion tells you to play notes and spaces, to let it breathe. You don't talk in run on sentences. So don't play 16th notes for 10 bars. You know, play a few. One of the, I, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite guitar players is David Gilmour from um, Pink, uh, Floyd. Pink Floyd. He's, he doesn't play busily. He plays long notes. He has pauses. And with so much feeling, that's that's the thing. You want to put feeling in it. Too. You want to mean the notes. You're not just playing scales. Um, well, there's a sometimes... reason why Eric Clapton is known as slow hand. Sure, sure. And he, and he can play fast when, when he needs to. He's plenty fast. He, I think he was faster when he was with Cream than he is now. He, I rarely hear him play anything fast these days. But what he plays is great. You know, each note sings and, you know, yeah. I, I think Clapton is uh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree uh, with you. I agree. Do you, you have a regular routine that you go through when you are practicing? It it really depends on what I'm practicing for. You know, because I've become an author now, a lot of my days are spent writing. Mm -hmm. So writing, you know, prose, not uh, not Music. guitar. So I don't practice as much as I used to, unless something's coming up that I need to practice for. Then I'll, then I'll really bear down. Like when I'm doing my show, um, I'll do a week of four or five hours a day, you know, and, uh, um, well, you've been playing so long that it's second nature to you at this point. It is. It is. What, what, what goes away is the calluses. <laughs> and then, then you remind it because it hurts and your muscles get sore too. So I try not to skip more than a day or so, you know, every, every day play something, you know, you just, have to you keep know. your body supple in some way. Sure. It, it's an athletic, it's an athletic thing, no less than playing football. You know, it's just that you're using your fingers instead of your legs or your arms or whatever. Yeah. So what would you say is the most challenging aspect of then not only uh, practicing a song, but developing a new song that you've never played before? What's the most challenging thing for you when you're trying to figure it out? Speed. Speed. Yeah. I've never been a fast player. Not, I've never been a really fast player like, like Steve Vai. I've always had so many other things going on, which that's that's the good news and the bad news. I've managed to support myself and never have to do anything but being a musician as a result of being able to do so many things. That was where that shapeshifter thing came in, in in the book. I believe that if I had practiced six, seven hours a day in the beginning and became a phenomenal guitar player instead of a very good guitar player, uh, it would have been different and I would have been able to play fast. But it really does require practicing hours and hours and hours and hours a day, you know, to develop that speed. But I, I haven't really needed it because most applications don't want that. Uh, an example, and I, I don't mean to degrade the guy because I don't even know who he is, but I saw the zombies perform a few years back right. out, out on Long Island. And uh, their guitar player, who used to be a friend of mine, he used to be a um, a &R guy at CBS, but he died. They replaced him with a young you know, slick gas guitar player. And, you know, the zombies are, they're the pop music, simple, you know, not drastically simple, but this guy was like full out distortion. It made no sense. He was fantastically good, but he needed to 
take a good close look at who he was playing with. Mm -hmm. it, it almost felt like he was trying to impress somebody who was listening, who would hire him for a band that would have music like that. And it didn't help. You know, I didn't like it at all. I preferred you, the original guitar player. You write in your book about yeah. the fundamental rule of being a backup musician. Mm -hmm. What is it? There's a bunch. <laughs> give, give us one, two, three, whatever you got. Okay. Um, humility. You're not there. This is not your record or your jingle or your session, whatever it may be. It's theirs. So when you come in there, people might want to hear your opinion. They might not. They might want to hear their opinion and they're paying you to play their opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and I made that mistake early on when I would hear them doing things that just made no sense and they were awful and I would tell them. And I, I, I wouldn't be totally rude about it, but I said, that, that's not going to work. No, you never say that's not going to work, ever. <laughs> what you say is, sure, let's give that a try. And then you do exactly what they say and let them realize that it doesn't work. But when you say it doesn't work, you're a dick, you know? And in these sessions, you if you're doing an album, for instance, you're living with these people. You're having meals with them. You're in the studio every day if, if you get hired for a whole album. Uh, so you got to watch yourself. You can't, you don't want to be too familiar unless you really know them very, very well, then it's okay. But still humility, you know, don't be the guy that knows everything. Don't be the guy that's critical of the, the, the singer songwriter, whoever you're working with, just be the nicest guy in the world because that's what you're getting paid to do. That's the job. And it doesn't hurt to do that. It actually takes responsibility off your shoulder because it's not your record. If would it's you, a bomb, you would don't you care. say it's very different if you are in fact the producer of the record? Oh hell yeah, <laughs> you're the guy who is ordering everybody around. You're the guy who can tell the guitar player that sucks. Don't do that. You know so what, you're, what you're talking about in part is the politics of being an artist. Yes, exactly. Politics of being an artist and or a producer or a studio musician, and the politics are different for each position. Sure. When, you, when you're the producer, you're the president. But but the artist sometimes is over your head. Not always. Because sometimes producers can be very, very pushy with artists. I had a producer, uh, sorry, uh, an artist that worked with Gus Dudgeon. And Gus, of course, produced Tumbleweed Connection for Elton John. I, he might have produced his first album, I don't remember. And possibly a couple other after that. And those albums sound fantastic. Gus, Gus is a great producer. But he told this artist to approach her music a certain way and she didn't like it it wasn't her music but he prevailed and she never ended up having a hit so was he right i don't know because i i never got to hear her side of the equation um i found with richard perry um one of the greats one of the greats richard was a very good friend of mine and harry nelson right oh yeah harry nelson ringo carly pointer sisters richard really knew what he was doing. And he had a way of making people do what he want wants in a nice way. How how and did he do it? He never raised his voice ever. He always was well he has this he has this deep voice that kind of sounds like that. He says, you know, just try it. You know, if you don't like it, I promise you we'll throw it out. You <laughs> never throw it out because he's always right. He's he's, <laughs> he's just I mean, we we did Your Sylvain with three different drummers and three different bands because he didn't like it. And Carly was fine with the first time around. So we had Andy Bound on bass and we had uh, Andy Newmark, her regular drummer on drums. And we did Carly, Carly on piano, me on guitar. We did a whole track. He threw it out the window. We come in the next day. What are we doing today? Oh, we're going to do Your Sylvain again. I said, oh, really? What, what was wrong with the last one? He says, nah, I didn't like it. Okay. And then two new people come in, Barry D'Souza on drums. He keeps Andy bound. Andy Newmark is gone. Carly didn't get fired and I didn't get fired. <laughs> so I did another track. And Barry D'Souza, good English drummer. Nope. And then all of a sudden, Jim Gordon comes in and it is magic. I finally saw or heard, I should say, what he was talking about. And Jim Gordon, I, I talk about his... Um, his resume is a six point font on 30 pages. Wow. You know, the number of people he's, oh my God, the, the monkeys, Crosby, Stills and Nash, Mamas and the Papas, uh, just lists of hits after hits, after hits, after hits. 
Um, unfortunately, he had a bit of a nervous breakdown and he is, uh, after murdering his mother, he's in jail for the rest of his life. Yow. But while it was going well, now he, he was diagnosed with alcohol poisoning. So they were treating for that, but when in fact he was actually having a psychotic break and they didn't treat him for it. And the voices got louder and louder and louder. And the poor guy, you know, he just lost his shit, <clears throat> lost his, <laughs> anyway, so that, that band, and and Richard went out there and told told Jim Gordon what to play it. I'm I'm sitting there going like, oh my god, he's telling Jim Gordon the guy. And in my conversation with Jim after the first take was, hi, uh, we haven't met. I'm Jimmy Ryan. I was behind the baffle over there. You didn't see me. Um, and I said, you're an American guy. What do you do in England? He says, oh, my band's on uh, on a kind of break right now. I said, oh, who who was that? He says, oh, Derek and the Dominoes. And I said, whoa, what? <laughs> and I said, wait a minute, you played on Layla? He goes. Uh, yeah, I played on it and I actually co-wrote it with Eric. And I'm like, oh my God, are you kidding me? <laughs> and I tried not to do the Wayne's World. I am not worthy. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite songs of all time. So, uh, well, you should be as a guitarist. It would absolutely. Oh, sure. Be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, so Richard would go out, go out in, into the drum booth. He said, when it comes to this part, I want you to go boom, 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 and, and just the toms. Only do the toms. I don't want to hear any cymbals, okay? And he would dictate what he wanted to do. And Jim never raised it, never complained. He said, sure, Rich, whatever you want. And and he did it, and it was perfect, and it ended up being the record. Do you prefer so, to be directed like that? Yeah, I kind of do. Um, it's all, For me, it's always better if people know what they want. Now, for You're So Vain... Richard kind of left me alone. He and I think of music, you know, right, even going way back to the Critters. He was, he hung out with us even then, you know, he was part of the Kama Sutra uh, thing way, way, way back in the 60s. R Richard Perry was going all the way back to the Critters? Oh, yeah. He, wow. he, didn't, pre he didn't produce this, but he was kind of friend of the family. Uh, Artie Rip, our producer, and Richard Perry were good friends, and Richard had some, uh, this, these, duet Anders and Poncia that he produced uh, and they were with Kama Sutra and eventually we worked with them too for a couple of songs but anyway all all these people were kind of hanging around but Richard kind of left me alone a lot because we think alike he, he and I were really good partners in crime because I always played the parts that he liked and I wasn't trying to play parts he liked I was playing the parts I liked and he ended up liking him so it worked very well I, I rarely got feedback from him. We're, we're currently in a very interesting, I wouldn't call it combative, but the solo on your so vain, he gave me a cassette, an audio cassette of the track and said, we need a solo here, go home. So I went home and I worked with it for an hour or two and I wrote a solo. I note for note, I wrote the solo, came into the studio and I said, all right, here's what I got. And I played the solo. I said, okay, so that's kind of the basic idea. You know, what do you want to do? And he says, you're done. And I said, what do you mean I'm done? He says, that's it. That's perfect. I don't want to touch a thing. I said, are you kidding me? Wow. Okay. That's what happened. I wrote the damn solo. It's not like we sat there and tried to work it out for us. So we do this BBC thing, uh, classic albums, no secrets. They do a, a documentary. They send a film crew to my studio here to do the thing. And I tell that story. And then they ask Richie, he says, one take. How about one weekend? We worked on that damn thing forever. I'm like, you bastard. <laughs> Are you kidding me? So he obviously, he's confusing me with something else, some some other thing. And, you know, it was a long time ago. It was 50 years now. Yeah, and this was sure. only like, I think this was like five years ago we did this. And, you know, I, I don't know what's up with his memory, but it's not good. <laughs> it was kind of embarrassing for me because both of those are in the same video. You know, mine and then him telling them that, oh, yeah, sure. One day. Yeah. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> I love you to death, Richard, but that's just not true. You've obviously done a lot of both studio work and performance work. Mm -hmm. Do you have a preference between the two? I have a financial preference between the two. <laughs> um, the, the, have, ro the road pays better, right? It's not that it pays better. It's that it, it pays on time. Mm. The, the thing is, if if you're on the road with an artist and you're on salary, every week your salary comes in. When you're dealing with record companies and ad agencies and people like that, they take their time. Uh, I was told by an employee of Young Arubicam, which is a 
big, big ad agency in New York City, that it is built into their um, financial system to not pay suppliers in anything short of 60 days, which means they can't issue a check. The, the, the computer will not issue a check. And then they just lie to you. They just say, oh, we lost your invoice. Oh, can you send us another invoice? I don't know what happened to you. You know, we're really busy here. Yeah, I think it's with accounting now. Your check, you know, it should come out any any day now. And, you know, now you're like 60, 70, 80 days waiting for it. You know, you got to run a company. You got to you got to pay your bills, your rent. And and I just I would hate that. That's one of the other reasons I, I hated being in the jingle business is it just it just took so long to get paid. And I, I found even working with Carly, I wouldn't be dealing with Carly to get paid for by the record companies. I'd be dealing with the record companies. Sure. In one particular instance, uh, we were doing backup vocals for six hours. And I talked to a producer. I don't remember which one it was. It might have been Paul, Sam not Paul Samuel Smith. He said, yeah, just call the record company, tell them what's going on. So I called him. They said, yeah, yeah, I have your W-4 right here. Uh, you didn't work six hours. I said, What? Of course, I work six hours. Check in with the with the, with the producer. They said, "Well, you weren't singing for six hours." I said, "What are you talking about? I can't do anything but be in that studio when I'm on call. I can't go do another gig. So you're paying me for my time. If I'm singing, that's great. If I'm doing, if I'm having dinner, I'm still booked during that time. You can't." And she says, "No, no, 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 no. Don't pull that crap with me." And I'm like, "What?" are you talking about just insulting and and you know call me a liar and this was arista records at the time i don't know i don't know who the woman was but she mm. was really ugh. and it's not the first time i've run into that i ran into that not time and time again but often enough that when we play live when when the hitman my my previous band the hitman we were touring for about 10 years it was a bunch of guys that that all had the same kind of resumes as i did right and the show and the show was all number one records that at least one of us had played on or or played in the band we got the check it's in the contract we got the check before we went on stage nice yeah so so every week there, there was money coming in and it was good money the band did very well so financially, I like playing live better. Obviously, you're playing is playing is playing. But is there a difference between playing on a record and playing in the studio? And I'm talking about the actual act of playing than when you're live on stage. Is there any difference? There is. Uh, in the kind of work that I've been doing, you know, if I if I was in Cream or, or a band like that where or Herbie Hancock's band or something like that, where, you know, 70 percent of the song is improvisation. Well, then you have to be really creative. With the Hitman, we were doing pop songs, so our parts were memorized. So they were kind of easy. When you're in the studio, you have you have to come up with stuff. Mm. It is your job to come up with hook lines and clever parts and things like that. So you're you're thinking and thinking. So in a, in one sense, playing live is easier. In the other sense, it's not because you only get one shot. In the studio, you get as many shots as you need. You know, if it's too many shots, they fire you. But uh, <laughs> you uh, you you get a number of times to to get it over till you get it right or till till they like it. Live, you got one shot. Is there a difference in terms of being a musician playing live and being in a Broadway show like Pump Boys and Dinettes? What is that difference like? Oh, I think it's the fear factor. <laughs> <laughs> for me, <laughs> uh, for me, I, I had a, a section in the middle of uh, Pump Boys and Dinettes where I was on the stage by myself doing a monologue. Okay. Now play, yeah. Now playing the songs, that was no big deal. That was easy. They were easy kind of country songs. And Loudon Wainwright was the lead and Ronnie Blakely at one point and Cass Morgan at another. Um, so I, I was kind of there in the background. I would sing the songs with them. Sometimes I'd, I'd have solos. But this is a section of the play where it was I was on my own, nobody there. And I had a long set of lines to do. And it scared the crap out of me every night because I always have this fear I'll forget my lines. And will I be able to just bullshit my way through it? Probably <laughs> not. So before the second act, when I do this thing, I would find a place behind a curtain or somewhere and I would rehearse the entire thing 
as many times as I could before I had to go on. I wouldn't be sitting, you know, drinking coffee in the wings. I'd be rehearsing my part. And I never flubbed it because I, I always rehearsed it, but I was always scared as hell. So there's that discipline again of, of rehearsal and getting it right before you do what you're going to do. Yes? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Because people people are paying to see you do amazing things. Why would you want to disappoint them? There's just no value to being lazy. Not in the professional world. No, 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 not at all. And you and you can be brilliant as a player and still end up behind the counter at a music store because a you insulted somebody, b you don't get along with people that well, and and c you're not that creative and you don't put an effort into it you know how, maybe how play- important to be a studio musician is it to get along with others ultimately important you want to be their friend you want to be the guy that they want to hang out with mm-hmm. it, it, it really is like that i mean if if you look at um taylor swift did a nice long video about forget which album it was and you could see her in the studio yeah there were cameras going and you could see that these people in the studio love each other just tremendous respect and they were living together. They were literally in the studio having their meals there. I, they, they rented a cabin out somewhere in the woods somewhere and, you know, brought all the equipment in and, and did the recording live in, in this. Well, not live. They obviously they do one part at a time, but the creative process needs comfort. You know, it's, it's really helpful to be in an environment where you feel free and you don't have a chip on your shoulder. And so you don't want to be the guy that agitates that. You want to be the guy that everybody says, yeah, man, he's really cool. He's, you know, he's funny. He's easy, easy, easy to work with. That's a key word. When you're getting recommended, if somebody says you're really easy to work with, that's such a plus. I mean, that that can sometimes work better than talent. I mean, obviously you have to have, <laughs> there's a baseline where, you know, you have to be at least a certain amount good. But if there's guys a, a little better than you, but you're the guy that's really easy to get along with, you're going to get the gig. So in the studio, there's this concentrated effort by all these folks that are working on this album or whatever it is you're creating. Uh, there's a concentrated effort. And clearly you need to be able to get along with people both musically and politically. Exactly. And, uh, interchanges between people. Mm-hmm. Is it more intense or less intense when you go out on tour and you have to be with those people for months or longer on the road? That's a tough one. Because if you hire somebody to be in a band, they're kind of a subordinate. It, it, sometimes they come up to equal, but not usually. If you form a band with your friends, then everybody's on an equal footing and nobody feels they have to be polite. You know, initially, yes. But as time goes on in the tour bus, somebody does something boneheaded, they get it. They they get machine gunned, you know. But but I thought musicians never do anything boneheaded. <laughs> God, they never do anything <laughs> not boneheaded. Um, girlfriends can be a problem. Wives can be a problem. Sometimes they get involved and it, it really, really rubs other members the wrong way. Um my wife made the ac- committed an accident of coming into our dressing room once, and two of the guys in the band really got mad at her, and she was she was devastated. She didn't think she'd done anything wrong, and then they came after me and said, you know, you should be more professional, and you know, you you should know better than to you know we're getting dressed. I said, no, you weren't getting dressed. You were completely dressed already. Right. What well, doesn't matter? Well, you know, the women should not, and it was so petty. But, you know, that's what happens with bands. You know, you, there's personalities involved. And if you're really lucky, you love each other and it doesn't go badly. Well, it's always about personalities. is isn't even playing the music. It's about the personalities that are in whatever the chemistry is in the band. Isn't sure, it? sure, sure. For better or worse. Yeah. And so what is the difference for you then in playing with someone who you think of as a, an absolute equal versus someone who may be equal to you, but is actually super famous, like a, like a, uh, a Paul McCartney or uh, like Carly Simon. Is there a difference in the way that you do your work around them? Yeah, I would say you're a little more careful uh, depending on how close you are to the person. And, and you, you even have to be careful there because you can overstep bounds I mean, Carly, Carly's an odd exception because we were very close friends before she ever made a record. She was my boss's girlfriend when I worked in a guitar store between the Critters and, you know, whatever the next gig was, probably Crazy World of Arthur Brown. And um, 
so we hung out, we double dated with my girlfriend and her and her and Dan. So when we started making records together, I was kind of like an equal to her, except in reality, I was nothing like an equal to her. <laughs> you know, if we had called it the Carly Simon band, you, you know, like Peter's Gabriel's band or something like that, and we were all getting the same amount of money, it would have been different. But I was working with her like I was in the band. When we did the Anticipation album, there wasn't practically a minute that I wasn't in the studio with them making suggestions and helping produce the whole thing like that. But I was a salaried employee, you know, so it's hard to say. And I mean, it just it so much depends on who you're with, how long you're going to be working with them. The longer you work with somebody, the more familiar you get with them. But be careful. Keep in mind that you are an employee and there, there are lines you don't want to cross. You don't want to say things to upset them ever. You don't bring subjects up. Uh, a perfect example. And, and again, this is in the book. Billy Joel used to open for the Critters. He had a band called the Hassles. And, yes. and he he was opening for us. So by just some crazy thing, I played out on, on Long Island uh, with Carly and a show that Billy put together to um, save the farmers out in out in the East End of Long Island. It was right. us and and the Cars and and Foreigner and and Don Henley and Billy Joel and Carly. It was just this amazing lineup. Anyway, when the when the show was over, I went to grab my guitar case and it, it was gone. I said, "Who the hell would steal my guitar case?" One of the Billy's roadies accidentally threw it in the truck thinking it was one of theirs. So he said to me, he says, look, we got your case. We're dropping everything off at Billy's. Just go over to Billy's house tomorrow and, and pick it up. And I said, go over to Billy's house. He said, yeah, it's, you know, such and such and such. So drive, you know, near the water in East Hampton, Long Island. So I go there and I hit the the, the little, you know, there's a gate. You can't just go to Billy Joe's house. And I said, sure. hey, hey, it's Jimmy Ryan. I came to get my guitar. I said, oh, yeah, Jimmy, come on in the gate opens up and I drive in Billy is just this prince of a man he gives us a tour of the house he's telling me he shows me this Steinway piano that you can see your face in it was so spit shine big nine foot Steinway that they gave him because after um, Leonard Bernstein died Billy became their endorsee so they gave him a piano like they would have given whatever. And I didn't ask him to play it, but we're talking and, you know, and everything's great. And Christy Brinkley's in the other room making lunch and, you know, and, I, and I'm there with my wife. And I just like a complete idiot. I said, hey, you know, we have something else in common besides the critters. And I said, he says, what's that? I said, your old producer was my old producer. He said, and his face changes. And I said, yeah, you know, Artie Rip. <laughs> and his oh. face just fell to the ground. Ugh. And I just said to myself, oh my God, why did you say that? Artie Rip took 10% of Billy Joel for like 15 years. He had nothing whatsoever to do with him, but he he had him in this ironclad contract. And I said, oh boy, maybe uh, I said, are you still, are you still paying? And he says, we're almost done. And then the next thing was, hey man, your case is uh, by the door. <laughs> and, and that was it, you know? And I know a couple of guys in Billy's band. If this guitar player ever quit, I could certainly play in Billy Joel's band. I will never get that call. Yeah, that's a that is that's a that was a political faux pas. It was a political faux pas. So when I say hey, there's a line when you're working with people like this, you don't have to be funny. Just be a nice guy and and do what what needs to be done. Don't be too creative. Don't bring up subjects that could be controversial. It, it's a suicide move. You know, in some cases, people have good sense of humor. They're very, they're they're very humble. Yeah, you might get away with it. Sometimes they're not. Oftentimes they're not. Watch your step, and then you'll have a good long career. And frequently, mm -hmm. if you make that faux pas and you do get, you know, pushed Black aside, ball. excommunicated, yeah. blackballed, yeah, uh, you sometimes you don't know why you are. It yeah. just happens that way because you yes. said something you don't realize you said it. Yes. So being being thoughtful around people is always the smart sure. play. It's an ego issue. You don't want you you want to, as as uh, what was it? Uh, not hands across America. The other, we are the world. Um, the producer on that thing basically had a sign: "Leave your ego here," and it was at the front door. That was Quincy Jones. Yeah, Quincy Jones. Uh, because oh my God, he had Diana Ross. He had uh, you know all these Michael huge, Jackson. Michael Jackson, of course. Lionel song, Richie. Like, sure. Lionel Richie. Cindy sure. Lauper was in there and tons of Kenny, them. Kenny, yeah, Kenny Loggins. Anyway, so so and and he said, "Leave your ego at the door." 
because he's going to tell you what to do. <laughs> exactly. And yeah. and he didn't want all those egos making a mess in the middle of him trying to record something. It yeah. probably under enormous pressure of time because mm -hmm. he had all these people there at the same time. And probably all of them wanted to had other commitments and needed to sure. back out the door. So sure. it was probably done in a relatively short period of time comparative to if you were making a full album over many days or weeks. Yeah. I'm just curious. You are also a successful songwriter and i'm wondering for you what in your perspective makes a good song good it has to say something in a way that well it doesn't have to say it's got to have some of these elements it has to either be saying something that you haven't heard before or saying something you have heard before in a way that you haven't heard it before mm -hmm. it has to have a twist and a catch it has to be a subject that is interesting to a lot of people not just you um and it has to be sung obviously by a good singer so if you're doing demoing a song you better get a good singer in there doing it because if if you do it yourself and you're not a good singer most artists won't be able to hear it they'll just hear your bad voice and then they'll they won't get past that so good subject matter told cleverly and i would say it needs to be clever music but taylor swift has made a career of c a minor f g <laughs> you know so many of her songs use that so so that element her production is fantastic so where she doesn't have real sophisticated chord changes she has great musicians good sounds you know really really good expression in her voice she's she has a very compelling voice uh, it, it's not a classical singer's voice. It's just a voice that's conversational and you like listening to it. So, yeah, I would say just the lyrics are very important. Or if they're not very important, then the music better be killer. Because <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Beatles got away with love, love me, do. You know I love you. I'll always be true. So please love me, do. They got away with some pretty bad lyrics. And and they, they got basically castrated by Bob Dylan. Mm. But they also came up with some extraordinary lyrics. After they got castrated by Bob Dylan. <laughs> Bob Dylan basically said, these guys have the ears of the entire planet and they're not saying anything. What's up with that? And John Lennon took that like, oh, you know, he took the heart. And then after that, he wrote across the universe and, and all these like amazing. I am the walrus. Cuckoo, you know, the, cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. And, and, and stuff like that so so on what do you compose your guitar or do you do you go to some yeah. other instrument yeah Gu you guitar guitar i haven't written a song in a very very long time if i was i was a um assigned songwriter for uh walden music for a couple of years and andy goldmark and i my writing party we, we would do it you know six hours a day every day and we would write songs that we thought were really good and they wouldn't get covers and songs we thought were pretty good did get covers. And I just didn't feel like writing for other people. On the other hand, when I got into writing for TV stations, I loved writing instrumental music. And I did it much, much better than I did songs. Because so, the, wor the words were the problem? Not so much the words were the problem. It's the restrictions were the problem. There's such a, a restricted format for writing pop songs, and very few people succeed getting out of that format. It's like verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, out. You know, most songs really follow that formula. The Beatles got away from that. You know, Eleanor Rigby. No, even that one was. Ah, look at all the lonely people. Um, was kind of a chorus, but when I write for TV so TV shows, I you know I've, I've worked on a number of TV films. You look at the action and you emotionally start thinking about what does that, what is a musical element that will make that come to life? And, and I'm good at that. That's something that I found. I wasn't, I don't feel I was that good at songwriting, but I was really good at doing that. And especially news. I had, a, no, geez, I wrote the themes for uh, CNBC's all their daytime shows, the financial shows right. in 2005. They've gone through several composers since then, but they always tell their composer to use my theme. So <laughs> they have to incorporate my theme. So can you say ASCAP? <laughs> You, I can say ask him. Yeah. So, so I, I still get royalties on, on a little theme I wrote in 2005. Those are the two, my two favorite words in the English language. What's that? Royalty streams. Royalty streams. Right. Exactly. Yes. You make money while you sleep. 
you make money <laughs> while you're just standing there. It's... Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> How important yeah. are titles as hooks? For songs? For songs. How important? Uh, they're important for anything you're trying to sell. They're important for a house in, in real estate. They are really, oh, and, and this is a very important subject that I wanted to jump in with here. They're really important for books, much, much more so than I thought. I name my book behind Autobiography of a Musical Shapeshifter. And there's probably two people in the world who knew what the hell I was talking about. Now, that's that book does not fly off of shelves. All my fans bought it. That was fine. You know, and I had a lot of fans from... Um, from the hitman and you know the carly simon days I, I posted it on all the carly simon websites and a lot of people bought it there but then it just stopped it's not flying off the shelves amazon is not recommending it because so as of yesterday we are reissuing the book and the title of the the name of the book is the superstar chronicles tales of life among rock royalty a memoir now you know what the book is about. It's like, <laughs> duh, there it is, right in your face. This is a story about superstars and living among them. Titles are really important. Really important. I assumed behind was a double entendre, that it was both you're behind the artist yeah. and that you can play from behind as well. Yeah, it was. that, that You got it. It was the shapeshifter part that nobody knew about. And I'd, I'd have to explain well, you, over and over. Hmm? You, you were able to write play for almost any anybody at any time. Well, it was more than that. I was able to be an actor. I was able True. to be a jingle writer. I was able to be a studio musician. I was able to be an engineer. I had to keep reinventing my... It actually came from Star Trek, from uh, Deep Space Nine, the character Odo, oh, yeah. who, was, who was a shapeshifter. He, he would literally be able to turn himself into a paperweight in an office where people were plotting the overthrow of Deep Space Nine. And as soon as he got all the stuff he needed, poof, he pops out and he's Odo. <laughs> a and he was literally called a shapeshifter. So I, I, would, I called myself a shapeshifter because when one career started to slide, I just start a new career, always within music or per, of some kind of creative performance. How long did it take you to write the book? This one took a long time. It probably took a year because, you know, I was touring with the hitmen. So, you know, I had to, uh, I would do it on weekends and, and, you know, whenever I had time. Um, the one I'm writing now, it's going like rockets because I, I now I have the time. I'm not touring and, and I'm putting full time in it. And, and you also have been through one. So you have a sense of how to do it again. Again, exactly. back to the notion of discipline. You've done it. You've rehearsed by doing yes. one book. Now you're doing a second yes. book. Yes. And and you find out, I use an editing program called Pro Writing Aid. And what Pro Writing Aid is, is it goes through your document and it tells you, you repeated this word too many times. You started four sentences in a row with I. Uh, your grammar is off here. Um, this sentence is sticky. There's too many words in it that don't really tell your meaning. And it just makes all these suggestions. And it's fantastic. It really, it really takes a pair. It doesn't change what you're trying to say. It just puts it in a way that it sounds more interesting. Mm -hmm. So uh, I worked extensively with that. And, and the editor really didn't change anything. in the It book makes your you writing edit. less ham handed. Yes, 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 yes. And yeah, the editor loved it because she didn't have to do hardly anything. She just found commas out of place and things like that. But uh, how good are you at receiving notes, both in the studio from producers? Are you good at receiving notes from people or do you have a yes. tendency to, to push back? No, 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 no. Well, it, it depends, but mostly no, 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 no. Um, my wife is very good at that. Uh, I started this book out and she read the first five pages or something like that. And she says, you know what? I don't want to finish this. And I said, why? She says, it's just not interesting. She says, you're 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 much more interesting than this. You've told the story exactly like it happened. Now put some put some spark in it. Take you you've wasted too much time talking about this. I need two sentences about that. All this detail, meh. So I did that. She says, now we're talking. Now we're talking. And it shortened it tremendously. I tend mm -hmm. to talk, I tend to talk too much and write too much. <laughs> You wrote in the book that I'm allergic to unemployment. Yes. So what do you do to stay focused between gigs or when you're between your writing? What is it you do to keep yourself at it? Or do you just keep plowing ahead? I just keep plowing ahead. If things aren't happening, I get on the phone. Like right now I'm, do I'm doing a show 
did we, we didn't talk about this and it's not in the book, but um, I do a one man show where I start the show off with a video, uh, several videos of songs that I played on. And and you can see me in the video and, and all that stuff. I said, these are songs I, I've written or played with these artists or something like that. And I finish with your so vain. Then I sit down and I say, I'm going to give you a musical TED talk. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what a studio musician is. How many people, hands up, how many people know what a studio musician does and no hands go up? <laughs> I don't know. And I sit there and then I take 10, maybe 12 songs that you know, songs that you're very familiar with. And I start off with playing them the way they come into the studio. And I know this because I've worked with so many singer songwriters. They usually come in with a strumming guitar, and they play the song. And I said, now this is where the song starts. And they listen to it and they go, what is that? That's lawful. And I said, now this guy comes up with this part. And then I play that part and they immediately recognize the line that opens the song. The Beatles are fantastic for that. I do Day Tripper and I just go, do, 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 got a good reason. And I said, if they had done that, it probably would have been a minor hit. I don't think it would have been a number one record. But I said, then George Harrison sits down and he goes, I said, that line, the second he plays it, you know what song is coming up. It is the biggest hook. It goes all the way through the song. Without it, it's just like a Chuck Berry's blues song. There's nothing really to it. It's just... Um, and I do, you know, like I say, 10 or 15 songs where some songs have a whole bunch of those things. And I, I play each little element. And I talk about, I actually do cashmere. Oh, I really? actually acoustically do cashmere. I, wow. I had a, I had the, the wonderful. How do you do cashmere acoustically? Now, I actually had a conversation with Robert Plant when I was living in England. Um, I was working with John Atwistle, the Who, their buddies. He came into the restaurant where we were sitting, sat down. Well, he sat down next to me. And you think I didn't pick his brain? And this this one gets really funny because the, there's a part in the song where he goes through all this fantastic poetry. And the punchline of the whole thing is, whoa, whoa. And he just goes, whoa. And I tell this story about how they go to the, they, they get to that point, they realize they forgot to write lyrics for it. <laughs> anyway, I, I don't want to give the whole thing away, but um, so I do about 10 songs like that. And it get, it's, it's funny and it's, it's informative and it's like a TED talk. And then, then when that's all done, uh, I pull the book out and read two chapters from the book. Then I take questions and hopefully I sell some books at the merch table. So I have been having this incredibly fun conversation with Jimmy Ryan for the last hour or so, and we're going to slowly wind this thing down. I'm wondering in all of your experiences and in, in show business and, and beyond, do you have a story that you could share with us that's either weird, quirky, <laughs> offbeat, strange, or just plain funny? Here we go. Okay, this is just weird. So this is Carly Simon's first band. It's me, Paul Glanz, Andy Newmark, and Carly. It's just the four of us. And in those days, you know, she was doing acoustic-ish songs. She wasn't doing these big, like, nobody does it better with, you know, with big orchestras. It was just folky stuff like anticipation. Right. So it's the four of us. And we're bored. We've done a bunch of gigs. And, and Andy Newmark is, is a really funny guy. He's the drummer. He likes to come up with quirky stuff. He says, I've got this great idea. And we're like, yeah, what? And it was, a, I think we were playing for a college. He says, let's wrap ourselves up in toilet paper and go out. And we're like, <laughs> what? He says, we'll go out like mummies. And Carly says, I love it. Let's do it. We wrapped it. We took like 10 rolls of toilet paper out of the bathroom in the dressing room and just started wrapping each other up to the point where we, we were mummies. And we got the <laughs> guitar neck sticking out of here. You can't, we're wrapped around the guitar. You can't see anything. So we kind of like step, you know, our feet close together so we don't tear anything. We go out on stage and people are, yeah. Uh, and they see us and we're wrapped in toilet paper and then we burst out of the toilet paper and we start doing i don't know anticipation or something like that is the toilet paper is everywhere it's all over the floor everything no one laughed and not one person mentioned it she signed <laughs> autographs we talked to people afterwards there was not a word it was the weirdest thing we've ever done it was just so ridiculously stupid and no one, I, they noticed it. It was really hard to not notice. We were wrapped in toilet paper. Including stage. Carly Simon. And she was just as wrapped as we were. <laughs> it wasn't just the band. She wrapped herself up too. My goodness. 
yeah so so that's that takes weird to uh <laughs> pretty high level so anyway. so i know you already gave us a bit of advice earlier and i'm wondering if you have any other advice you might like to uh, lend to those who are starting out in the business or maybe they're in a little bit and they're trying to get to the next level in the world of professional musicianship do you have any other thoughts yeah make sure you're good before you put yourself in a big door before you go through a real big door that could be a career changer be prepared you know don't go in half cocked don't go in and play something to demonstrate what you can do that you don't do really well because it, it's a one shot well it's not necessarily a one shot deal but it's a one shot with that that group of people you want to always be prepared. You want to rehearse. You want to practice and give it your absolute best. Don't don't go in half cocked. That is super solid advice because otherwise it will show and people will not hire you. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. Jimmy yep. Ryan, this has been a just a fantastic hour oh, on Story you. Be today. And I can't thank you enough for spending your time, wisdom and, and thoughts with us today. My pleasure. And can I just do a plug for the book? Sure, please do. Sure. Okay, so the book is, it's out under a different name, but it's going to be re-released probably in a month or so. It's currently under the title Behind, Autobiography of a Musical Shapeshifter. And that's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all over. It's got a five solid five-star review, 85 reviews. It's doing well, but we want it to do better. So we're changing the name. And in a month or so, it's going to be called The Superstar Chronicles, Tales of Life Among Rock Royalty. And that's what the book is about. It's Tales of Life Among Rock Royalty. But it's the same. But they're the same book with a different title. It's the same book, but I'm adding a new chapter to it. Uh, the story about uh, it's about a seven page story about my experience being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, going to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and which performing. I, which I saw you and uh, right. Olivia Rodrigo. Right? Olivia Rodrigo. Yeah, that that coming out of nowhere and uh, getting a chance to perform for 7,100 people with Steven Tyler and Lenny oh, Kravitz. Got, and you've LLT. got you've got rock royalty right in front of you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And fortunately, when I I did your so vain with Olivia Rodrigo, fortunately, I couldn't see them because if I had seen Steven Tyler right in front of me, I'm sure I would I probably would have flubbed my solo. <laughs> but but the spotlights were right in my eyes. And I was focused and I practiced and practiced. Even though it's a simple solo, you know, you can mess up a simple solo. You can squeak or something like that. Um, I knocked it off without a mistake. And then I saw the video, who, who was in the front row, you know, the rhythmics and, oh my God, glad I didn't see them. <laughs> I got to see the, uh, I got to see it, uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame ceremony. That was terrific. It oh. really was. Jimmy Ryan, this has been a fantastic hour. I can't thank you enough. Steve, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much. So as promised, we have a real treat. Please sit back and enjoy now Jimmy's unreleased song, Slow Burn, which he wrote, produced, and played all the instruments, sung by Joe Lynn Turner. Here now is Slow Burn.
And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. Story Beat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden. And may all your stories be unforgettable.